Have you guys lost your damn minds? Why would you replace this, which does routing and wireless, with an old computer that's just gonna suck up a lot of electricity and run hot and otherwise be annoying? Well, because you can turn your old PC into a really awesome router. So this is a Tenda AC router. It's got built-in wireless. It's got an ability to be a USB print server. Uh, you know, it's fairly compact. It runs off a of power brick, doesn't use much power. The thing behind me is a small form factor Dell. Uh, the small form factor Dell, this particular one, is an i5-2500, which is extreme overkill for a router. Unless you're in a business that's got, you know, 100 users, you don't really need that much horsepower for a router. That's crazy. But if you're a computer science student or you're wanting to learn networking or you're wanting to build just a really powerful router that's more powerful than consumer grade gear, kind of like what something that you would run into in the enterprise or in business, well then you can start with a computer. You don't even need any sort of fancy special hardware. You can put a, a distribution on it, a BSD distribution like uh, PFSense and turn a computer like that into an Epic router. Now, strictly speaking, you really ideally have two network interfaces. That thing's only got one, but it's got two expansion slots, and so we can add some more NICs to it. Uh, the particular network cards that I've got, I've got a two-port Intel NIC, so you'd have a total of three, and I've also got a four-port Broadcom adapter, so that's got a total of four on it, plus the one on board makes five. If I put both cards in there, I'll have a total of seven NICs coming off of this i5-2400. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, how does that work? Well, normally you don't really even need to do that. You would just run the router into another device called a switch, and for your wireless, you would run it to a wireless access point. And you would put your wireless access point somewhere convenient, like the middle of the ceiling, or somewhere you know in the attic, or somewhere conveniently located in your house. All too often, people have terrible Wi-Fi connections, and it's because the, the router is you know under a desk, in the floor, in some corner of the house where you know nobody ever goes. Oh, it's like, oh, it's in the basement under the hot water heater. Well, of course your Wi-Fi is going to be terrible, but if you put a wireless access point in a central location in the house and then you've got an Ethernet cable back to your network connection, back to your router, back to your you know, ISP's outside connection, you're going to have a lot better experience. So your first step on the road of enlightenment is to build your own router so that you can understand how to secure your network and you can do some really advanced things. Having your own router means that you can do things that you can't normally very easily do with a consumer grade router. For one thing, PFSense has an extensive plug-in system. These plugins provide things like a transparent proxy, uh, VOIP, intrusion detection, uh, an HTTP proxy, all manner of extensions and plugins to this system will let you extend it in ways that you never really thought possible. I mean, yeah, you can do a print server and that kind of thing, but you can do so much more than that. It's really, really nuts what you can do when you've got a full computer that's actually doing your routing. You can run a DNS proxy. You can run pretty much anything that you can imagine. So let's take a look at installing PFSense on something like this. Now, the first thing that you've got to do is prepare your USB stick. When you, when you prepare a USB stick, you've really got two options for the installer. One, you can set up a USB stick that's already sort of a ready-to-run installation of PFSense. And what that means is you stick the USB stick in the computer, you boot off of it, and then you're in PFSense. It's going to walk you through a wizard to configure the network interfaces, set it up, and then you're good to go. That USB stick basically becomes a permanent part of your router. That's what PFSense boots off of, and that's what it runs from from now until the end of time. Now, that's a little bit more limited. You can't really use the plug-in system as well, and there are some features that you don't get in PFSense. But if you want a you know, lightweight, compact, you know, no-frills installation, that's certainly one way to do it. If you want something that's a little bit more featureful, you're going to use the USB stick to create an installer. And so what that means is that you boot off the USB and you use it to install it to the computer. Now, the computer will need an SSD or a mechanical hard drive, something for PFSense to install to. Another USB stick would also work, but I'm not going to recommend that because generally USB sticks are not as reliable as a hard drive. But if you want to use a 64 or 128 gig SSD, that'll be fine. It'll run like grease lightning, and that'll be enough space that you can do things like run a caching server or run a proxy server or something like that. So proxy server means that when you download a big file from the internet, assuming it's on an HTTPS connection, that big file that you download from the internet will be cached on the router. And so things like Windows Update or things like you know packages that you might download from a Debian repository if you've got multiple Debian machines on your network, those will actually be cached on your router automatically, transparently. So when you download those files, they'll actually come from your router the second, third, fourth times that you, know, you, you need to use it rather than having to re-download that over the internet. If you've got a metered internet connection, doing that kind of caching can really save you some bandwidth 
against your data cap, whatever you might be running into in terms of uh, you know your data cap. So in general, if you're just in a mode to learn or you're wanting something to fart around with, I'd recommend going for the installer USB stick and then actually install it to the hard drive on the machine. Once you've created your USB stick on Windows, you use Rufus on Mac OS or Linux if you're creating the USB stick from there. You can just use DD to write the image directly from the disk image file um, to the actual USB stick. Uh, the installation instructions for how to do that are online. There's a link below in the description. Once you've got your USB stick, you just plug it in the computer and you boot off of it. The installer is going to come up and it's going to ask you to configure some settings. It's going to ask you about your keyboard layout and some other physical parameters of your machine. Basically, you're just going to hit enter and next all the way through this. It's not really going to be a big deal to install this. Once you do the installation, it's going to copy the data from the USB stick to the onboard hard drive. Then the whole thing's going to reboot. The next thing you need to do is configure your interfaces. So if you want to do it automatically, you want to make sure that all of the network cables are unplugged from the device. And if you do A for automatic, then it'll ask you to plug in a cable to the particular interface. And so you can just you know, use a Sharpie or a label maker or something and actually label the physical network interface that you want to be the WAN connection, that is the connection from your ISP, plug in the cable to there, and then once the light goes green, that's an Ethernet link light, then the PFSense should detect that and say, oh, that can be your WAN connection. You can do the same for LAN. And then in the PFSense vernacular, there's another type of network connection called OPT, and that's an optional connection. If you want to have a physically separate wireless network, for example, um, you can use OPT1, uh, your first optional network interface for your wireless access point. If you do that, then people that are on your wireless network are physically isolated from your wired network. And you can set up firewall rules and bandwidth rules and other sorts of rules to prevent people on the wireless from abusing the local network and vice versa. If you're an advanced user, um, you don't even really need more than one physical network to do that. You can do it another way with VLANs. Although if you're going to do it with VLANs, I would recommend getting a switch, an Ethernet switch that does VLANs, and setting up VLANs on your Ethernet switch and then setting up your access point that hopefully also supports the VLANs um, to use the VLANs on the switch and then you configure VLANs on PFSense and it's like as if you have multiple physical adapters but you only have the one LAN connection and that's why you know if you, even if you've got a router that only has two Ethernet connections you can still use VLANs to set up a really really complicated PFSense setup with tons and tons of interfaces if you really want to that have you know quote unquote physical isolation but that video is a little more advanced so we'll save that for another day. Now for my particular setup, if, if I'm going to use this four port Broadcom adapter, I'm actually going to have three optional interfaces because I've got LAN and WAN and then OPT1, OPT2, and OPT3. And because of which network interfaces I pick, I can say the onboard connection, which is an Intel adapter, is going to be my WAN connection. And then LAN is going to be the top port. And then, you know, OPT1 is OPT1, the second port, third port, fourth port you know, all the way through OPT3. If you can use the Intel adapter, then the machine's gonna have a total of three interfaces. And I'd say this is much more normal for your PFSense router that you're gonna learn on. And so the onboard connection, I'll assign that to WAN. And then the first connection on my Intel adapter, that'll be LAN, and then my, the second one will be OPT1. And so that'll give me some flexibility in terms of, you know, WAN and LAN for my main connections, and then OPT1 for wireless if I really want it. In terms of where do I plug in all of my computers, well, for that, you'll need an ethernet switch. You can get an 8, 16, 12, 24 port ethernet switch and you'll just have a cable that comes out of your router and goes into the ethernet switch and then all of your computers will plug into the ethernet switch as well. Now this setup is gigabit through and through and the i5-2500 will have no problem pushing full gigabit speeds even for VPN, even for anything like that. <laughs> Those of you out there that are on Google Fiber or are fortunate enough to have an ISP that can push true fiber optic bandwidth, something like this is going to be good for you because it is hard to find a quote unquote consumer grade router that can really push gigabit under all scenarios. It doesn't necessarily bog down under certain kinds of traffic. So like if you're torrenting or if you're doing, you know, a peer-to-peer, -peer, like you're downloading a game and the game's downloader has some kind of peer-to-peer -peer system for actually doing the download, you can have full gigabit from your ISP, but a lot of the time consumer gear can't keep up with full gigabit in all the scenarios in which you might be generating traffic, receiving traffic, or transmitting traffic. Something like this has definitely got the horsepower to handle it. Once you get your interfaces set up, then you can just go to the IP address on your local area network. Now, by default, PFSense runs the DHCP server. A DHCP server is uh, a type of service that this computer listens on the local network for requests from client computers. 
his client computers plug in and say, hey, is there anybody in the network that can give me a hint about what the configuration should be so that I can get on the internet? Well, DHCP is the service that does that. And so PFSense has a built-in DHCP server that you can configure the parameters for if you want to get under the hood and tweak some things. But by default, the DHCP server will be enabled. In both the GUI and the, the command line sort of text interface that you get on the console of the router, you can configure the DHCP server, turn it on, turn it off, whatever. When you're first setting up the machine, it says, hey, do you want a DHCP server? Nine times out of 10, yes, you do. In the corporate environment, if you're deploying this in a corporate environment, uh, PFSense should not be your DHCP server. Most of the time, it's gonna be your Active Directory controller or you know your LDAP server or some other infrastructure on your network. Your router is not usually your DHCP server in the enterprise. I can sense a lot of network administrators in the audience saying, well, but we don't have anything other than a NAS and some workstations, so our router is a DHCP server. Okay, well, I mean, that's fine, whatever. That's totally okay. But the point is, your DHCP server is going to tell your client machines how to work or you know, what IP addresses to use. So if you plug in a laptop or you plug in a desktop and you get it to get a new DHCP lease, it's going to be assigned an IP address by your new router. When you do that, you can go to the IP address of the router in your web browser and then you've got a much easier to use web configuration GUI, just like a traditional consumer router. This is where you can install plugins. This is where you can tweak the settings. This is where you can do anything more advanced that you might wanna do. The first thing that you wanna do is set a password. Once you've set a password on this, that will help really secure the device. Now you can enable SSH if you're familiar with SSH. SSH is sort of a remote control, remote interface, remote Unix administration. Uh, thing that's been around since the dawn of time. SSH is its own subject that you could talk about for hours and hours and hours and write thousands and thousands of pages of books. But know that the SSH service is available and you can turn it on if you want to. But there's so much other stuff you can do in the configuration here. Even just out of the box, the thing is gonna generate graphs, traffic graphs, show you how much traffic you're using, how many packets per second, inbound and outbound. It's gonna support IPv6 and IPv4. Um, a lot of new ISPs will give you internet routable IPv6 addresses. So all the devices on your internet can be just completely naked on the internet with no firewall if you want to with a publicly addressable IPv6 address. Now they don't let you do that with IPv4 um, addresses because there's an IPv4 address shortage. You'll have to use network address translation. That's what PFSense does by default, network address translation. But for IPv6, your ISP can tell your router, hey, this range of internet, you know, publicly routable IPv6 addresses is available to be assigned to devices behind you. And you set the rules such that everything is wide open then internal devices to your network can be completely internet routable, which is not something that you want most of the time. But IPv6 is something that's fully supported on the newest versions of PFSense. Now that we've got it configured, how do we deploy it? How do we use it? Well, if your ISP uses DHCP to assign you your public internet address, then pretty much all you have to do is plug your DSL modem or your cable modem or your you know, fiber optic termination point or whatever uh, directly into the WAN connection on your router. Once you do that, the ISP's equipment should allow PFSense to issue a DHCP request to the ISP to ask what its public IP should be. Now, if you have an ISP that uses PPPoE or layer two tunneling protocol, L2TP, or uh, any other you know, DSL, PPPoE, you know, whatever, then you'll have to configure that as an extra step on the WAN settings in PFSense. So your ISP hopefully has documentation for that. Hopefully you know enough about that that you don't get too lost setting that up, but you may have some additional steps that you have to do on your WAN interface. If you have a static IP from your ISP, meaning that you know what your IP address should be and your net mask and your gateway, then you can key that in manually on the, the WAN information settings. But by and large, 95% of people out there, just a DHCP configuration option. And you'll have IPv6 DHCP as well, typically. Once you've got your WAN connection plugged in and your LAN computer that's accessing the web browser, basically you should be on the internet. The only other type of problem that you would encounter commonly is maybe a DNS problem. DNS is the thing that converts a name, like a google.com, 
into an IP address like 8.8.8.8. .8 when you have a new piece of equipment like this, sometimes the correct DNS server doesn't always make it through. So you may want to go and configure the DNS servers actually on your router. Sometimes you don't want to use your ISP's DNS server. Sometimes you want to use OpenDNS or, or you want to use Google's DNS servers or a third-party DNS server or something like that because maybe your ISP's DNS servers are slow. You can configure all of that through the, the web GUI. Sometimes you have an ISP that does weird stuff like this crazy YouTube caching server thing. Well, you can go on firewall rules and block a YouTube caching server which will actually speed up your YouTube process. So now that you've got PFSense set up and installed, you've got a whole new world open to you. You should go here and check out the available plugins and don't be afraid to experiment with the available plugins. If you brick the machine, just keep that USB stick handy and do a reinstall. You can back up your configuration before you actually make any changes so that if something goes horribly wrong and it destroys everything, uh, you can just do, do a fresh install and then you can go to restore your configuration and it'll take your router back to the moment where it was messed up. You can get good at this and with a machine like this, you know, you can be up and running from nothing again in five, 10 minutes. So this is really a great learning platform and this is really something that's awesome that gives you a ton of flexibility in terms of what you wanna do on your own local network and in terms of being able to see what's going on on your network, what kind of connections are your machines making out to the internet, you know, how often is Windows 10 phoning home this gives you the capabilities to do that. This, with you know, a mechanical hard drive or an SSD hard drive where you've got a lot of storage, unlike a consumer grade modem, you can store months or years of logs on here to actually see what these machines were doing, where they were connecting on the internet, and, and that sort of stuff, so that you can know exactly what your machines are doing on the internet. Another really great plugin that PFSense offers that I'll mention really quick is called Snort. And I really wanna do some separate videos on Snort specifically. Cisco bought Snort, but Snort is a really, really awesome intrusion detection system. Snort is an engine, but there are intrusion detection rules that the community maintains, that Cisco maintains, that a bunch of other companies maintain. Uh -huh. And you can use those rules to actually ferret out all of the stuff that's going over the internet. Because when you're downloading you know, 12 gigabytes of Windows updates from Microsoft, having the router sift through the 12 gigabytes of, of data looking for anything that looks nefarious, uh, that's just an exercise in bureaucracy. But with, with the rules in an intrusion detection system, it can look at it and it can say, oh, this is a known vulnerability. Oh, you've downloaded a virus. Oh, something from a bad place on the internet is trying to connect. Oh, Chinese hackers are at it again. Oh, Russian hackers are at it again. Those rules are insanely valuable to you in knowing what sort of traffic is good and what sort of traffic is bad. And so that will be part of any intrusion detection system. There are some other options available with PFSense. You can also do stuff from the command line through SSH with PFSense. But this is really just the first video, hopefully of many, that use this as a basis to explore some functionality. Hell, if you wanted to use PFSense as a, uh, you know, an internal SIP router, there's a SIP proxy. So you can use your PFSense machine as a SIP relay for voice over IP that's actually reasonably secure as opposed to putting your SIP devices out there on the internet. The SIP traffic can be filtered through your PFSense box if you wanna go that route. So PFSense has a ton of flexibility, a ton of features, and the PFSense team has done an amazing job with the software. If you want to, you can actually buy routers, physical hardware routers directly from them to support the project. And those are those really nice Alix small form factor, you know, six inch square and inch thick machines. I happen to have some. They're based on the AMD APU. You have three network adapters, so you've got LAN, WAN, and OPT1. Internally, it's got three mini PCI Express connections, one of which is for an SSD or whatever that you might run. And the whole platform is, you know, very low power, but it's a full PC. It's full x86. And so you can install PFSense on this and actually run with it. And it's great. Now, it doesn't have as much horsepower as an i5, but it's also a lot less costly if you were to buy that new. The only reason this works for us is because we're basically using surplus. You don't have to use a sexy small form factor computer. You can use a full desktop computer. Hell, you can just use a motherboard on a, on a desk if you really wanted to. You could use an old server, an old server with error correcting memory and all the you know, robust oomph that you get from an old server. And that makes a perfectly fine, reasonable router. Hell, we even use Supermicro routers, you know, Supermicro 1U half depth, um, you know, Xeon D or uh, Socket 1151 Xeon servers with error correcting memory. And those are for, you know, 500 user LANs with all the, you know, you know, all the bells and whistles as far as corporate monitoring goes and, you know, being able to mon monitor instant messaging systems, instant messaging programs, the ones that don't use encryption anyway. Um, over the land through PFSense, those are really big features for the enterprise. So if you decide to embark on a journey with PFSense 
and experiment with the plugins, let us know how you did. Let us know what you set up and let everyone at level one know what you learned so that we can contribute to the pool of knowledge. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you in the forum.